Now, with generative AI, we developed something called context-sensitive translation. And context-sensitive translation really is getting machine translation, getting your own language corpus in the form of translation memories, and your keyword corpus in the form of a glossary, blending it all together with every single sentence that gets translated and proposing feeds that are context-sensitive. Hello, my name is Gabriel Fairman, and today we're going to be talking about web localization 3.0 using BureauWorks. Well, for starters, let's start deconstructing what we mean about web localization. So web localization is the process of making a website available in international languages. So for instance, you take a website in English and now you make that same website available in Spanish. That's web localization. And the reason why we're calling it 3.0 is because generative AI has opened a new wave of possibilities around how to manage different kinds of content with specific kinds of treatment. So when we think about web localization 1.0, we're talking about a very slow manual process. We're talking about content management systems that weren't localization ready, which meant a lot of treatment around code, around manually having to recreate directories, very difficult to create a continuous localization process. So that's what we call web localization 1.0. And again, when I say we, this is very specific to me, our company. These are terms and ideas that we've come up with over the years. Maybe other people use the same terms, maybe they don't. But big disclaimer here is that these aren't necessarily universal truths. These are our truths. Web localization 2.0 came at a later stage when more and more sites became localization ready. They began using content management systems with their own translation management framework like Adobe Experience Manager, like Drupal. Content management systems that already had the idea of localization as a need from its their very inception. So that's 2.0. Now with generative AI, the entire dimension around content really changes quite a bit. And when we're talking about web localization, the beauty is the opportunity that it enables. So if you think about the same traffic now localized in Spanish or in Brazilian Portuguese or in Mandarin Chinese, that same website is now able to rank for more keywords in different languages, which will create more traffic, will potentially increase its quality scores due to relevance, will enhance accessibility from buyers who do not speak that original language, and ultimately more buyers, more market share. So there's a huge business opportunity around making a website available in a different language. But the challenge is that for a very long time, this web localization process was just so, so, so expensive. You had the investment in the content management system per se, then you had probably the need for some kind of transition management system such as BureauWorks. And then above and foremost, you had the challenge of managing those translations. Now, if you take our website, for instance, our website had 400 pages in English, an average of 1,000 words for every page in English, which makes a total of 400,000 words. And just for a rough calculation, let's suppose that each word is going to cost us 20 cents per word. That would be 80,000 dollars per locale, locale meaning the language is a specific language slash country combination that we're localizing into, five locales would lead roughly $400,000 just for the translation effort. So that's talking about our website. We're not a huge company, but we do, we are globally present. And $400,000 is a pretty significant investment for us. So even though we saw the opportunity, it was a very expensive endeavor for us to engage in. Now, think about things from the marketing perspective, our question really is, what is the shortest path to revenue? That's always the marketing perspective, at least our marketing department is definitely thinking about a cost benefit ratio, right? There are always actions that we engage in that are going to generate quite a bit of return. Other actions are gonna be less expensive with less return, more expensive, more return, and you have that this matrix. You're always looking for the lowest investment for the highest return, right? That's the sweet spot in marketing. So when we looked at this from the web localization perspective in the past, really our first go-to was working with machine translation. And machine translation had the upside of being very inexpensive, but it also had the downside of not being keyword sensitive, of being often embarrassingly clumsy. And ultimately, Google Analytics was really quick at identifying that the content was generated through machine translation. It wouldn't rank very well. The keywords just weren't there. There was the treatment of the text just wasn't good enough for a human to read through comfortably, which led to high bounce rates and other key indicators flagging just not good quality content when you began to localize. So MT would fail. 
right, as an alternative, as an inexpensive alternative. Now, with generative AI, we developed something called context-sensitive translation. And context-sensitive translation really is getting machine translation, getting your own language corpus in the form of translation memories, and your keyword corpus in the form of a glossary, blending it all together with every single sentence that gets translated and proposing feeds that are context-sensitive. They're they do exactly what they what the word self entails. These are sentences that are being translated through an engine that is making sense out of the given context. So let's say, for example, you're translating into a language where you mapped out that the word localization doesn't exist and you should translate again into translation. So you're mapping out both translation and localization into the analogous term for translation. The context sensitive translation will take care of that. So let's say you have the idea of home as a domicile and you have the idea of home as the initial page. The context sensitive translation is able to keep those differences in context in mind. And it's also able to learn from edits. And the beauty of the context-sensitive translation is it leverages uh, large language models such as GPT-4, but not in their ability to translate. It leverages these large language models in their ability to make sense of these different contexts that are being offered by machine translation engines, by translation memories, by glossary, which ultimately results in an engine that's very inexpensive, is keyword sensitive, so you can adapt it to your own keyword strategy, much less clumsy, even though it does make mistakes when it does make mistakes. These are typically less embarrassing mistakes than machine translation epic fails. And analytics are quite happy with context sensitive translation, at least for now. They seem to be written in a way that appeases Google ingestion bots. Now, Previously, it was either an all or nothing thing, right? Either, you know, you had these websites who had very, very terrible translation with machine translation or no ter translation at all, or you had a full-blown, super expensive with large overhead to manage full-blown localization effort. That's currently been the norm. So you either see companies that are really operating on a global scale, they're really taking this thing seriously, they're investing millions of dollars into this localization initiative, or you have companies on the other end of the spectrum who don't translate at all. There's very little in between. Now, web localization 3.0 really enables most companies to become international friendly. So the key thing for us to keep in mind when it comes to content is finding the minimum translation requirement for content localization. And that's what we call MTR. Again, this is our term. Doesn't mean that it's out there. That's uh, the idea of this is finding the minimum translation requirement for every given kind of content. And to exemplify this, let's say it's your homepage. Well, your homepage probably means a lot. Your homepage probably has a few different things that are quite sensitive to marketing, whether it's puns, whether it's slogans, things that really need to be treated carefully. Typically, homepages are not a lot of content. So it's not that expensive from a cost benefit perspective to really invest in a good layer of transcreation, for instance, at, as an MTR for your homepage. Now, in contrast, for instance, let's say we're talking about a low ranking support page with a lot of content. Well, maybe for now that content doesn't get seen by a lot of people. It's probably more technical. Doesn't make sense to expose to in increase the min minimum translation requirement very significantly for that because it's gonna get expensive very quickly. To contrast again, if it's your terms and conditions, well, because it's legal content, because it's legally binding, makes sense to in increase the minimum translation requirement for that kind of content as well. So the key thing is that different kinds of content require different kinds of treatment when it comes from translation management. And our goal is to find the minimum translation requirement for every different kind of piece of content. So it's not an all or nothing strategy. It's not translate and spend $400,000 or don't translate and don't spend anything. You open this path where you can incrementally spend as you grow. That's very important from a marketing perspective because enabling scalability is everything, right? Most interesting marketing processes, they have a fairly large barrier to entry. So most people either engage full on or they don't at all. And now we're talking about lowering the barrier to entry, which makes this a lot more accessible and a tool that could be a lot more interesting for many businesses around the world. So first, let's keep a few things in mind, right? Even in English, it's not every single page that's going to be indexed. Without getting too deep into this, Google does not crawl and index every URL. They have a specific algorithm that chooses, depending on the site and depending on the quality scores and the number of URLs, it decides how many of those URLs are going to be consumed and indexed. So that's something very important. When you translate into other languages, you automatically expand that 
capability because each language is treated as assuming that you're localizing in, in a coherent way, in ways that are compatible with Google's understanding, you're likely to be able to be indexed in these other languages in addition to your indexing in the English. So they don't cannibalize your indexing in, in the English, they increase your indexing capabilities. So from a cost benefit perspective, you're able to, for instance, capitalize on certain keywords that are very accessible and within reach in another language that are almost impossible to rank for in your current language. So in English, for instance, that's definitely the most competitive language from a keyword research perspective, so or keyword search perspective. So you're going to have to put in a disproportionate amount of effort just to get yourself up there in the top 30, top 20, top 10. And it's it's for those of you that are used to doing SEO, you know how hard it is to rank well for highly competitive words. Now, when we're talking about markets where those words aren't as big, yes, the opportunity isn't necessarily as big, but it's a lot easier to rank for those words. And some, there's, there's a cross border effect that takes place with these words that once you start ranking for a keyword in another language, I don't know exactly how the process works, but it, they, based on our data, it seems to impact very positively your ranking in your original English language. So from this cost benefit perspective, it makes sense to invest in other markets purely from an SEO perspective, even if you don't expect to drive business directly from that given market, right? You're expanding the number of keywords for which you're ranking. You're expanding the traffic into your website and you're looking better in front of Google and you're opening this possibility to adopt an iterative approach. So let's say, for instance, you begin by translating a few pages with full human intervention, another few, another number of pages with context sensitive translation. As you begin to rank and gain traction, as you begin to give more traffic and conversions in that language, then you open the door to further iterations, right? So instead of having to go like all in and invest a ton of money and not know exactly whether that's going to work or not, you can invest iteratively, which is amazing, right? From a marketing perspective, in my opinion, there's nothing better than investing one little step at a time. So when we're talking about these minimum translation requirements, we're talking about leveraging these augmented actions available in BureauWorks. So level one would be pure context sensitive translation. So you have your keywords, you've invested a bit of time and money in investigating these keywords in the languages that you're translating into. You've imported them into BureauWorks. Now you're running them through context sensitive translate. That's the the minimum level that we're working with. A step above that would be to also run what we call BureauWorks translation smells, which is going to flag for semantic issues, mistranslations, awkwardness, redundancies, anything that may be weird in your translations. That's what we call something that smells. And if you run these smells, then you'll be able to flag attention from a given translator, for instance, on exactly those segments that aren't smelling well. The beauty of that is that you don't have to look at every single segment. You only focus on those that have something that are smelling funky. So that's a step up. The next step up would be to also process a form of QA. So again, engaging with a human to read through the content within context and reading through it and flagging potential issues from the viewer's experience. So that would be the context sensitive plus smells plus QA approach. Now, the third level is to have a full human translation intervention. So in this case, you have the context sensitive translation engine that's working alongside the human to suggest the best possible feed and then learn from the changes that the translator is making and then implementing those changes and going in an iterative pulverized learning cycle where the engine gets more and more adapted to the preferences that are being taught by the translator. That's a more expensive process, but it is also the one that delivers the highest level of quality. And obviously you can continue to build on there. Maybe you're going to have another level of transcreation after that. Maybe you're going to have another level of real localization and market testing after that. So you can continue to build on these levels of approaches with every single level that you add, you're going to spend more and you're probably going to gain more too. So that's the different kinds of approaches that you can have with these contents. Now, one of the things that's beautiful about BureauWorks is because you have the customization of workflows, you can create these different workflows based on content relevance. So you could create, for instance, a context sensitive plus translator approach for high traffic pages, and you can create a context sensitive but 
plus nothing else for load traffic pages and so on. And you can build these different conditions and workflows so that you set the path for a continuous localization process for websites. And then that is key is whatever framework you're adopting, it's really worth investing some time and energy at the very beginning to connect with BureauWorks, either through connectors or through our API and webhooks to make sure that you have a process that when you create a page in English, that you generate that page translation in other languages. And if you update a page in English, you can also create the same process. If you get really more mature, then you can look at other things, for instance, and doing the reverse path as well. So if you start to create terms, pages in Spanish or Portuguese or Chinese or any other language, then you also start to repopulate these pages back in English. That's a little bit trickier, but that's definitely the direction that we see web localization 3.0 going into. So as we spoke, right, the context sensitive plus translator approach is really worth investing in your homepage, maybe your pricing page, maybe your legal terms and conditions, and really whatever pages you have that you believe have more traffic. And this is always a function of your budget and the relevance that that given market has for you. If it's a high relevance market, or if you have a lot of budget, you should definitely go with a context sensitive plus translator approach. That's going to give you the best results. And it's still a lot less expensive than the traditional translation lifecycle. Now with context sensitive plus QA approach, my opinion is to begin to do that with samplings of your website and how they're seeing. And based on the results of your initial QA, I think that then you're in a good position to decide what kinds of pages you're going to flow through a full translation uh, workflow, what kinds of pages you're going to just do the context sensitive translate or plus smells or plus QA, because then that's going to give you a very good assessment of what this quality is feeling like. So the qualitative result and the quantitative result from this QA process is very important. I can't emphasize enough how important it is to run this QA process from with people who understand your product and who understand your market, right? You don't want just people looking at your website from a purely linguistic perspective, it's really important to make sure that people are looking at it from a potential buyer's perspective. So, and these are a few of our results after three months engaging in this methodology. So we doubled our organic traffic, not just in English. When, if you consider all of our languages, we doubled our organic traffic. That was very significant and unexpected. I mean, we were going to markets that we had no idea whether we would traction or not, and we doubled that. And we increased our keywords by 300%. So we went from 800 to 2,400 keywords. Very significant. Again, in only three months, that's what I want to emphasize. And from purely using our tools. And as far as traffic per country, we increased very significantly our traffic in Brazil, for instance, by 92.96%, in Germany by 153.92%, in Poland by 548.81%, in France by 311.51%, in South Korea by 883.08%, Mexico 284.78%. But here's where it gets super interesting. And that's, I mean, those large percentages are kind of expected, right? In markets where we had very little presence. But in the US, which was our main market, we increased our organic traffic by 99.7%. Think about how crazy this is. We made this effort into localization, but really where we saw the benefit from an SEO perspective was in our main market. And again, that is the key thing I want to emphasize about this huge localization opportunity is that localization adds a lot of credibility, a lot of accessibility, and a lot of keywords and potential quality to your website if done correctly. In the UK, another big market for us where we were already very present, we increased by 174.37% as far as organic traffic. So these were huge wins and unexpected results for us. And the beauty of all of this is that we, so we had higher indexation rates, even in English. We had improved quality scores. We had the doubling of our tra organic traffic in 90 days. And not only that, but the entire localization process made us even more aware of potential improvements that we could make to the English copy. So this was a very rich process for us. And what's very interesting is from the translator's perspective, there's always this idea that generative AI is going to cut on their work. But think about our case, right? We were a company that was gonna, not going to spend a single cent on localization because it was too expensive. Instead, through our technology, we were able to do make this work available to us. So instead of investing $400,000, we were able to internationalize our website, investing $50,000, which was within budget for us. But now, because we can see positive results, now we're in a happy, virtuous cycle where we can begin to invest more and more and more 
locales and more content and more quality. So this generative AI framework allowed us to open the door to a lot more content, a lot more languages and a lot more investment in this because now we can see through this minimum translation requirement paradigm that this is a valuable investment, a valuable opportunity that makes sense to us. And it's opening up new horizons to spend more. I really want to emphasize that we have no idea when it comes to content. There is so much content awaiting to be generated. There's so much content awaiting to be translated. And the only reason why it's not translated or not generated at this given point in time is that because it's currently too expensive, at least within the current frameworks and constraints that people are working in. And I do want to emphasize that if you're an early mover in this direction, you have a huge edge because eventually it's the nature of content. It's going to be universally available in different languages for different personas with hyper localization. That is definitely where we're going. And if you take a step further in that direction, you'll be definitely protecting your brand and enhancing your growth possibilities. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed watching this video. If you did, please like and remember to subscribe.